morning. My name is Carl Weaver. Welcome to Smartphone Summit and my presentation, The Global Smartphone Revolution, Trench Hole. Good morning, everyone. Today's presentation will talk about China, which I term the mobile digital dragon, and India, which I term the IT super tiger. Today's presentation will talk about the global smartphone revolution, the concept of converged mobile devices, where convergence is going, the difference between a smartphone and a PDA. Secondly, we'll talk about the mobile digital dragon. Finally, we'll speak about the IT super tiger, India. These are two very strong images of these two ancient yet strong and growing countries, especially in the wireless and IT space. So the global smartphone revolution. You know, the mobile device, it's already changing the, the basic way that people in the United States, China, and India communicate. However, that starting point of mobility is very, very different across countries and cultures. And smartphones are going to allow them to integrate tasks, duties, and basically what we're talking about is the mobile internet, utilizing the smartphone as a voice-centric device to do that. Voice-centric with data. So what is a wireless converged device, you may be asking yourself. Is it a phone? Oh, look, I have a phone here. This happens to be actually a smartphone. Not the best one made in the world, but it is a smartphone. Notice the Microsoft-like UI. When you take a PDA, a data messaging device, and a cell phone, when you converge all those together, that is essentially what you call a smartphone. However, when the functions become more valuable than combined, combined than separate, that's really when you want a smartphone. So you really want integration in these mobile devices. Very often there's a space savings. Well, look at this, I have a smartphone, so look at I can do everything. I can surf the web, I can do everything on this device right here and right now. When there's little or no compromise, I don't want to compromise size, I need small, I need something that fits in the pocket. Actually, it makes things simpler, not more complex. I need complex simplicity not complexity. I think smartphones are quite there yet in that category, but they're getting there. And finally, basically you want to remove clutter from your pocket. I want one device. I want it to do everything. I want that device to be my main tool for business. Converged devices. Well, these are nothing new. We've been converging technology, and we continue to converge technology. Basically, but people are skeptical, aren't they? They are skeptical of these converged devices. How much is it going to take you to plop four or five hundred dollars down on one of these? You're going to be a little skeptical, aren't you? Because there have been design failures in the past with these mobile devices, haven't there? Basically, technology wasn't there five years ago, but it is there now with advances of technology. And it makes for, uh, for, a, complex, it makes for a complex user experience. Basically, when it does that, I mean, look, I am too busy as a businessman. Make it simple for me. I need to make my calls, and I need to surf the web, and I need to communicate with my clients. That's what uh, enterprise users want. And finally, if there's no clear customer need. So people are skeptical when, well, why do I need a TV on my phone? I don't use, I don't watch TV at home. Why do I need it on my phone? Now, there's something called mobile device convergence. And a lot of people are confused. What's a smartphone? What's a feature phone? What's a PDA? What's a wireless PDA? <laughs> My goodness, all of these terms people are still trying to come to terms with. All they want is something that creates productivity for their busy business life. And basically, if you look at smartphones and feature phones, these feature phones really capture about 70% of the world market today. Smartphones are growing. They are growing. If you listen to Microsoft's image of smartphones, well, a smartphone is going to do everything in the future. Probably not, however, However, the imagination of the manufacturers is limitless. They will continue to come out and recreate the form factor. So I'll talk a little bit further about that in just a few slides. But look at the GSM cell, uh, cell phone tiering structure. Basically, smartphones, the prices are coming down because, why? Feature phones. Feature phones combine 
similar technology into the same type of form factor, and they deliver at a much more cost-effective cost price. So they're bringing the price of smartphones down. And uh, then you've got the mid-tier, feature phone, low-tier, and then your quote-unquote basic $25 handset that Motorola and others are trying to promote into third-world markets. So what, what, where are smartphones and PDAs different? Why do they differ? Well, you have a few different software camps. But generally speaking, as you can see here, this is kind of the Microsoft camp here, where your data-centric handheld device, where voice is secondary. Yes, you can make a voice call, but it really is secondary. So basically, when you look at this, the design is for two-hand usage compared to one hand with the smartphone. So if you're asking, what is a smartphone? A smartphone is essentially supposed to be used with one hand. And if you look at a data-centric um, device for the Pocket PC, really has very little telephony beyond perhaps Wi-Fi, maybe Bluetooth, essentially. And they also may have GPS uh, for the tracking capability in the device. But all of these technologies are interchangeable, and they have been interchangeable. They want to put, uh, basically, GPS on a smartphone as well. So there's no set rule in these converged mobile devices. I like to talk about diversity of handsets now. They come in all shapes and sizes. Sometimes you don't even know it's a smartphone or a cell phone or a converged device when you look at it. Um, they, they're getting pretty funky. You've got your slider, your front slider, you've got your side slider phones, you've got your tablet-like PC-type PDA devices, you've got your, you've got your swivel type, You've got your slide out, your left slide out, your top slide out, and your regular old generic Motorola. This is a Motorola phone type flip phone. So, in terms of the form factor, they're incredibly creative right now. And consumers, what do consumers want? They want personalization, differentiation, and they want to become, they want it to become a, as critical as the brand. Well, you know, I need it customized. I want to watch the Mariners win opening day, well they didn't win the opening day, but anyway. I want to watch that on my mobile device, right? That's what I want to see. Operators, what do they want? They want to customize the handset with basically a singular <coughs> user interface, a singular brand, a singular customization. What do the MVNOs want? Well, they want to serve integrated and voice data services. They want, they want to combine everything, but they have content. So what do they want to do? They want to take that content they want to lease the lines from Sprint or Verizon, and they want to provide a unique service based on the content that they have for what? To generate revenue in their business model. So, Operator's original plan was just, just to sell a few mass market phones. Hey, we'll sell millions of these. We'll get out to the market. We'll make a lot of money. Oh, yeah. But the market has changed because customization has occurred because there are so many segmented market groups really not just in the United States, but globally. Let's talk about convergent lifestyles. They influence these converged devices. Now, let's be honest. How many, and I'm going to ask you a question, how many of you have used your cell phone and your spouse has told you to turn it off? Can I, can I get a show of hands? Can you raise your hand? Oh, a few. Okay, well... My wife does it all the time. Anyway, so people work at home. We, we have Soho. We all have Sohos. Now, we need it. We can get online. We can check our email. But people also do interesting things at work, at home, and work. They pay their bills, of course, during lunchtime, right? And, uh, but there's a social impact of this converged lifestyle. You know, when I travel in and out of Asia, sometimes I have to, I have to use the restroom, and the, and the damn thing is ringing. I just let it ring. But basically, you have no privacy with these mobile devices anymore. They know where you are 24-7. Maybe that's what you want. I say turn off the cell phone when you go home. Don't let it interrupt your family life. Don't do that. So there's a new generation, though, of mobile information workers. We're all this new generation of mobile information workers. And basically, these society workers, they're the new adopters of the smartphones and these converged devices. Convergence attracts the youth market. You ask any carrier, not just in North America, but around the world. What is the market you're going after? Well, for smartphones and converged devices, it's the youth crowd. I haven't seen a 16-year-old guy or a 50-year-old guy 
walk into a, f a store, and I watch people. Uh, can I have a smartphone? No, not going to happen. So basically, it's going after the early adopter crowd, which is the enterprise market and the consumer market. But these are two different animals. Is there a need for a smartphone? Absolutely. We want these devices to redu we want these devices to basically create everything that we need in the business world. And the consumers, they want to play their music too, right? They want, they want to watch TV. So you have the enterprise and the consumer market at the same time going on here. The enterprise market, there is no single killer application. I'll say this again. There is. Everyone's looking. Everyone's asking me, what is the killer app for smartphones? There isn't one. There isn't one. Because um, there's no, there's no uh, killer application to drive smartphone uptake. The phone is no longer a single device. So it's actually categorized into specific devices. Let me go on to the second part, which is That means the mobile digital dragon. I've termed that mobile digital dragon. Has anybody here been to China? Can you raise your hand? Oh, a few. Oh, fantastic. <coughs> so look at the mobile users in China. I mean, it's essentially going right off the chart. It's the largest mobile subscriber market, market in the world. And many, many people have two, a few SIMs. But the government, as of December, January of this year, said, anybody with a SIM module, excuse me, you now have to register with the government. Local and foreign, you have to register with the government. Too much spamming going on in China. Every time I go into China now on my mobile device, I get all these incoming calls. Mr. Weaver, hello, good morning. Welcome to China. It's like, oh, well, thank you. <laughs> In 2005, what we can see here is that Nokia still leads in the entire China space for mobile devices. They also lead in India, second, of course, by Motorola, and then Samsung. This is actually combined GSM and CDMA. If you look at the CDMA side, no, uh, Motorola actually leads that in China. And you can see the differentiation between GSM and CDMA users. China handheld. Uh, handset sales volume, you can see the volume there. It's approximately 20 million GSM and CDMA handsets were sold fourth quarter 2005. And these statistics are a little bit uh, slow coming in China. You know? It's tough to get information, exact information at times. I wanted to show you this, which is branded handsets. These are just the branded handsets selling in China. Not necessarily the manufacturers, but the branded handsets. You've got the Taiwanese. Mainland Chinese companies, quite a bit of those. So, would you think that they've discovered branding? Yes, they have, in a very big way. There are 60 licenses to manufacture cell phones in China. Guess what? A lot of these companies, and a few of them in 2005, went bankrupt. A lot of these companies are going to go bankrupt in 2006, in 2006 as well. And the reason is because the $25 handset is going to kill them on the low end. And those who haven't invested the past two, three years in, G in 3G technologies might be out of the ball game. Might be out. This is kind of a regional distribution document here. Kind of shows you, you can see, much of the development in the north, in the Shanghai area, the Yangtze River Delta region, and of course in Shenzhen, Dongguan, Guangdong area of China. With a few exceptions, you've got Kyocera with a factory way out nowhere. And you see with a factory in the middle of the country. Now, Yangtze River Delta. Has anybody here been to Shanghai? Can you raise your hand? What do you think about Shanghai? Shanghai regains its eminence as the financial capital of the world. Maybe Wall Street will have something to say for that. But if you look at history, a hundred years ago, this is where the elite of the world would go, Shanghai. Basically, finest resource for handset manufacturing environment. Everyone has hand handset manufacturing who is manufacturing mobile devices in China, in Shanghai and Beijing, even if they're manufacturing in Guangzhou or Shenzhen. And rich water supply, don't know about the water myself, but anyway. Skilled university educated, you have Nanjing University in Nanjing, you have Jiao Tong in Shanghai, you have a bunch of solid universities, Hangzhou with excellent software capabilities. This is the strongest region within China for software development. And it's a magnet for multinational companies. Look at all these companies with offices in the Shanghai area. Now this is what I call the greater integration strategy. 
it's really an untold, but I like to tell it secret that much of these mobile devices, the design really, really takes place in Taiwan. Look at this, this is Motorola, right? It says Motorola, right? Motorola 220. It's actually designed by a company called Chime in Taiwan about a year and a half ago. Not the best device, but anyway, it works. So Taiwan basically designs a major portion of the mobile devices in the world today. Taiwanese companies. They're either doing it in China or doing it in Taiwan. Third largest manufacturer, contract manufacturer in the world is Honghai, Foxconn. Guess what? Apple is coming, up with, coming out with a cell phone. Who's going to make that? Probably Honghai. Probably. Probably. I don't know how Motorola likes that, but that's the reality. The market is too big, and if you're going to play it in a big way with your iPods and your mobile devices, you better go with a very large manufacturer who can produce the volume at, uh, at acceptable uh, pricing ranges. So I call this the integration strategy. This is what I call the evolution of the Chinese handset industry. Now, I've left out Hong Kong, but Hong Kong have design houses. They design cell phones in Hong Kong. They just don't manufacture them there. Design houses, quite a bit. You have, essentially, Western ODMs, OEMs going into Taiwan, dealing with these particular vendors and others, and basically say, well, can you design this handset for me? Can you do a bomb of $50 on this smartphone? Can you do that? They'll go and they'll talk to a bunch of handset uh, ODMs in Taiwan, Compel, or Reebok. manufacturing. They have the manufacturing arms in China as well. And now China handset OEMs are urging, are using contract manufacturers and design houses to build 3G handsets. So what's happened in the past two to three years is now these, these independent design houses have sprung up in China. And now these, com these companies are saying, uh, don't outsource to Taiwan for the R&D. I can do it. Cellon, TechFaith, Longchair, a bunch of these other companies. Let me go back to that slide. If you notice, India is just starting to build them. I have some more slides on India in just a moment. I'd like to talk about the global sourcing taxonomy. So, OEM, original design manufacturer, uh, or, sorry, OEM, original equipment manufacturer, Motorola, Nokia. Then you've got ODMs like Compel, Chime, Arima, Quanta. Then you have companies like Inventec, BenQ. Those are what we call OBMs. They started out as ODMs. They're still doing ODM work, but they're also creating their own brand. BenQ, of course, makes the Siemens phones now, that line. And um, these design houses, these independent design houses. I want to talk a little bit about the rise of customized design manufacturers. Now, this is very, very interesting. It's new, a new phenom phenomenon. Basically, you have these design manufacturers. They buy the handsets. They buy them from the manufacturers. They customize these handsets, the UI. They customize the UI. And they resell them to operators or resellers. Q-Tech, have you heard of this company? How about iMate? They're going to be at the show tomorrow. And Blaze, there's another company from Israel and then the UK as well, they, they call them Blaze. And then O2, go into Hong Kong, try to buy the, the Universal, what they call the Jazz Jar from the, with Motorola, uh, with the Microsoft uh, WinMobile 5.0. It's branded in Hong Kong with the O2 name, but it's still Windows Mobile 5.0. So you can see that these CDMs, they're beginning to, to interface, they begin interfacing with white label manufacturers. But they will serve tier two and tier, and also eventually tier one manufacturers, because what they do is they customize. They provide that. They can combine the sales and marketing, logistics, and the customization, the branding. These Asian manufacturers, they're weak at branding their names, extremely, extremely weak. And so they've decided, you know what? OEMs don't always want ODMs to brand either. They don't. They will take their business in a heartbeat away from you if they feel you're, you're eating or cannibalizing their markets. Here's an operator customization. So you can see that you have device customization house with software OSs. Then also the industrial design Frog. Frog does a lot of work for Apple. And they work with, these, with the contract design manufacturers who work in turn with the OEM and the ODMs eventually to interface with the wireless carriers. 
So this is something new. So if you've seen your Win Mobile device and it doesn't say HTC, although you know HTC makes it, this is the reason why. It's difficult to take these converged devices and just put them in the hands of the end user without the customization. People need customization, again, with these complex devices. Let's talk about the smartphone market. The prices are dropping. Competition. A lot of competition. They're demanded in China. Even though China hasn't released its 3G licenses, it will. But they're demanded in China now, these smartphones. People are still buying the smartphones even though they can't use them on 3G networks. PDA phones using Linux OS, which is the most popular. Um, the Chinese government was bought a bill of goods that Linux is free. Oh, Linux is free. No, it's not. Not if you add applications. Linux is not free. Windows Mobile, Pocket PC, it's gaining in China as well. Microsoft can take a lot of money and, and invest it into China. That's what they're doing. Uh, the 3G era, it's going to start. All the hype we've been hearing for the past three years about 3G has to come out this year. It has to. Any more delayed, and it won't be used in the Beijing Olympics because you need to deploy and it takes time to do the testing. And the operators are going to play a key role. <coughs> now these are very, very sophisticated devices. So the operators, you, can't, you, you have to provision these handsets, these 3G handsets, and these converged smartphone devices must be provisioned. You can't just take it from the department store in China, <coughs> plop your SIM module in, and expect the things going to work perfectly. No way. The operators, the operators realize that, so they're, they're taking back a little bit of the control of which of these 3G devices go onto the network, because they can harm the network from the end user side if used improperly. This is the smartphone OS market. Now, I've left, I've left Palm out of that, because Palm is kind of going through some changes here. But generally speaking, Symbian still owns the lion's share of the market, followed by Linux, and then WinMobile. I'm sure people will dispute that, but that came from just one of the research organizations that I deal with. Smart, China smartphone sales, 2005, as you can see, about 20% there. So it's a dramatic increase. The local handset manufacturers are making smartphones. This is the reason. These are domestic and foreign vendors with smartphones in China. And these are some of the models of smartphones in China. Now, Taiwan has a, actually, Taiwan has a very, very sophisticated market for converged devices and smartphones. Taiwan is a very small place, 23, 24 million, but it has a 100% saturation rate, and it has a very, very high reuse rate, um, uh, repurchase rate as well. Because Chinese don't like to buy secondhand, right, normally? They like to buy brand new. At least Chinese with a lot of money, they want to buy brand new. They don't want secondhand. DR shows it. Well, yeah. Okay. So handset devices in Taiwan total 120,000 120, units. 30% contributed from pen-based PDAs. 70% for converged devices. And if you can see here that these are the operating systems and the models that are being distributed in Taiwan. Dopod. Dopod manufactures in China under CECT, and Dopod also um, produces uh, cells in Taiwan under the HTC name. But it, it is HTC. Dopod is HTC, um, at least for the branding purposes. Smartphones. If you know how to take how to make them smart, what does that mean? Well, okay, I know people have bought their smartphones. They've never downloaded an application. Not one. They buy the smartphone and there it rests just using voice-centric calls. Very rarely will they surf the web. That's because on a very, very small device, it isn't such an, an, an interesting user experience on a small, small device to surf the web. This is China's 3G, 3G migration landscape. So everyone knows that it's going to 3G. We all know that. When? Q3? Perhaps. Probably. These are some of the possibilities that I see happening. Now, they haven't released them, so I, I still get to make a prediction, right? Here's my prediction. Possible. Possibilities, anyway. China wants 3G networks operating by 2008. We know that. 
They want to take advantage of all the revenue. We know that they like to use their TDS CDMA protocol. We know that. We also know that China, China Mobile has said, you know what? I'm going with WCDMA. I've got millions and billions of dollars invested. And your TDS CDMA, sorry. And China Unicom has said, well, huh, I've invested a lot in, in this Qualcomm CDMA 2001 XRTT. And that's the one that I'm going with. And they have been vocal, much more vocal, as of recent to the Chinese government, saying, let's let the market decide. Unfortunately, in China, no. The market will not decide. The Chinese government will decide. Generally speaking, TDS, TDS CDMA technology, it might be used to support the two existing systems. More, a more likely scenario is that China Telecom and China Netcom will adopt one or two of these networks. More likely scenario. Also, more likely scenario is you'll see WCDMA and TDSCDMA dual mode handsets, or maybe tri mode handsets. Possibly. If China delays deploying 3G much longer, India will deploy before China. Oh, that's a big face loss. That's a big face loss. China Mobile has already jumped ahead. <laughs> They've been testing un unlicensed 3G networks already. This is how they did it with CDMA technology about five, six, seven years ago. They already had a network in China before um, it was sanctioned by the Chinese government to use Qualcomm's networks. They had already been operating it unlicensed. So they're not going to wait for the last second. Chinese government said, hey, don't jump the gun. Don't jump the gun. So you can see they're chomping at the bit, the carriers, to enter and earn revenue on these 3G networks. People are dying for them. Um, so here's China's handset initiatives for 3G as I look at it. These brands, they, they, they've fallen far behind the leading players. So actually last year, a bunch of Chinese handset vendors kind of did the deep six. And more and more this year will do the deep six too. They simply will not be able to compete with three existing 3G devices out there by Nokia, Motorola, and Samsung. That's a few other players. Um, they've, been slow, they've been slower to market these new products, um, and they possess very, very weak R&D, extremely weak R&D. This is why you find the stronger companies going to, the North, going to North America on the west coast of the United States, from Seattle to San Diego, and they put their offices there. Why? tap the R&D excellence and the to tap the 802.11 technologies that are proliferating in the IEEE and uh, the access of that information and the acceptability of that, of that uh, technology in North America. So the smarter companies, ZTE, Huawei, a bunch of these other companies, they're there on the west coast of the United States utilizing, working, developing technology. <coughs> ZTE, Huawei and ZTE and of course, Amoy, these companies, and Amoy more than anybody else, stands out for developing unique 3G devices. And 3G handsets will take more time to ramp up. Operators need to roll out their networks. 3G handsets will, will be high-end niche products. And not everybody's going to run out immediately in China and buy a 3G device, that's for sure. If that were the case, then PHS would be long gone. And guess what? PHS is not going to die in China. It's going to continue. No need for it to die. Not everybody's going to buy a smartphone. Skype. Skype in China. You know, actually not quite the whole world can talk for free. China's going to ban Skype. They are going to ban Skype. They've publicly said that they're going to ban Skype. So if you can make a Skype call, consider yourself lucky. Because you'll be, blocked, you'll be knocked out. I make Skype calls to China all the time. It doesn't always work the greatest, and I always get knocked out. They've got technology to do that now, and that's, gonna, that's what's going to happen. I want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about the subtle art of doing business with the Chinese, shaping Chinese business personality. I find it very, very common when I talk to my Western counterparts how simple they think the Chinese market is. Oh, it's easy. It's easy. They all speak English. Man, that's, that's, that's the biggest mistake when looking and trying to understand and interpret the Chinese market. It's very complex. The Chinese personality is also very, very complex shaped through thousands of years, and most recently, shaped through the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, 
Modern influences, though, are influencing China. Guess what is influencing China the most? This thing. Probably next is TV, probably third is internet. That's because Chinese now have access to this, this technology, and you can't stop it. And they love this technology. They have access to it where they've never had it before, at least in the past, pre previous to the past 10 years. So this is the biggest influencer. We Americans are influencing China. We're buying all their products. Everything we have is made in China. But we're influencing them, I think, in a very, very positive way. The Chinese circle of influence. Has anybody ever noticed how the, in a Chinese restaurant, the table is normally in a traditional Chinese restaurant? The table is round. Ever notice that? Ever notice how Chinese jade is traditionally round as well, sometimes? Chinese believe in this continuity. They also believe that the most important unit is the family unit. And so how do you as a foreigner go from the stranger to the friend to the inner family within the Chinese personality? How do you do that? You do that through a concept called guanxi. You develop the guanxi. You can't buy guanxi in a 7-Eleven. Guanxi is earned. And it's developed in a social context, in a social environment. And it could take weeks, months, years. It could take a long time. But it is absolutely critical everywhere in greater China to develop guanxi. Because the Chinese won't do business with people they don't like. They won't. Finally, <coughs> Mianzi. Well, Mianzi is next. What is Mianzi? Who knows what Mianzi is? Can you raise your hands? Anybody here? Mianzi is what? Face. You know in the back, don't you? What is Mianzi? Face. Is, is face important? Okay, I'm probably losing mine right now. <laughs> Understanding Chinese legal environment and contract usage. It's really funny. I, I've been through this for a, a decade or two. People thought that when you sign your contract with the Chinese, everything's done until I go, oh, hey, I have my contract. That's it. No. It's like going to Safeco Field in the first inning and thinking the home run that was hit out, oh, the game's won, right? No way. No way. You still have 90 needs to go with the Chinese, much to the chagrin of the Western companies who want to basically close the deal, but to the advantage of the Chinese who want benefits. They want more pennies, perks. Give me, give me, give me. Um, you have to navigate China's socialist system, and that's most complex in China. It's red tape. India has red tape as well, a different type of red tape. Uh, these are, through my career, some of the strategies that I have used in dealing with the Asia Pacific market and as well the Chinese as well the Chinese markets. I recently worked at setting a woofy up for the present employer that I'm working for now. Believe me, it was like pulling nails. These are some of the problems I've experienced. Ten years in Asia, ten year, twelve years back here in North America helping companies sell to Asia. It never fails. These these same issues occur. Western companies are very weak at understanding the Asian world in general, but especially the Chinese world. It's a 5,000 year old history country, and India is a, a quite a few thousand years as well. We as Americans better understand how to interface with these countries because they're going to be the top economies in the world in 10, 20 years. That's just the way it is. You can take it black and white with your coffee in the morning. We have to play catch up because we have transferred our manufacturing of these mobile devices already. Once the manufacturing goes overseas, so go the suppliers, so go the markets. I can talk to these later on for people who want to talk to me about these or their experiences after the end of the show as well. I just have too much going on with this presentation. I want to get, it, get through it all. Now, India, I call it the IT super tiger. India's wireless future. And wow, what a fantastic future by 2009. And it could equal the US market in less than five years. And you say, how? Well, guess what? Last year, at exactly almost this time when I presented here, India was at 50 million subscribers. Let me ask you a question. 
What is the current subscriber capacity of India? Does anybody know? How many subscribers are there in India? Can I, can somebody answer that? How many wireless subscribers are there in India? There are 85 million. Wow, one year. There are 85 million, 84, something like that. Basically, our pool is expected to be as slow as $5 over the next, next 18 months. But growth continues with Reliance, which is on the CDMA side, and Bharti, Bharti which is on the GSM side. And uh, Indians, they look at the mobile device as 21st century tool. Oh, yes. Just like China. It's a status symbol. Everyone wants one. Everyone wants one. They don't want used. They want new. Well, some people will take used, but it's better to have new. India's wireless market, it's much, much more advanced than Western people think. I've been interfacing with China since 1982. I've been interfacing with India since 1985, 84. And let me tell you, these markets are very sophisticated. It doesn't matter that, that they're third world countries. What matters is there's a huge market. There's a market for your technologies from the West to sell into India and China. My strong <coughs> advice as a fellow who's been doing this for 20 years, is focus your energies. If you're in the wireless industry, if you're in the mobile device space, focus your energies on these two markets, and you will succeed. So don't ignore Japan. Don't ignore South Korea. Don't ignore Taiwan. Don't ignore Singapore. But focus your energies on these two countries and work the peripheral business. This is a good strategy. This is a subscriber breakdown. India is an awfully big country with a lot of states. And this is a subscriber breakdown as of early March. India's leading operators. These are the leading operators, and here are the totals for their current subscribers as of early March, basically. And as you can see here, Bharti, you can see the penetration right here. Bharti is at 21. Um, Reliance, Reliance has 70%, uh, but they also have a GSM network. India's wireless subscribers, more than 4 million users each month. 85 million strong. And uh, it will be the third largest market in the world. Well, it's obvious, the subscriber and the population. Cellular infrastructure in India. Nokia announced a long time ago that they were going to manufacture in India, and they are manufacturing in India. But guess what? The whole world woke up, at least the whole mobile device community woke up. They said, well, we're going to India too. Foxconn, Honghai, has been reported. They did buy Philips factory. They've been reported to start, or they will start production on an OEM basis for Western manufacturers in India very, very soon, Honghai. Those are the guys that do a lot of work for Nokia and other vendors. Look at handset CDMA versus GSM. Replacement rate is 24 to 36 months, and that's going down as well. Nokia is the leader. Samsung and Motorola and LG just behind. Taiwanese are in there. The mainland Chinese companies are in there. The South Korean companies are there. And sales of these GSM handsets, 70%, 74% of total sales of GSM of CMA phones were, were, uh, were made up the, up the rest of 2005. Um, you can see here that WCMA originally was supposed to hit in 2007. Now they're saying, well, they want 3G, or at least some version of 3G, before 2007, perhaps the end of this year. WCDMA, CDMA 2001 XRTT, 3G by any other name. Smartphones, yes. Now, contrary, the market for smartphones in India is very small. But there is a market because enterprise users are buying these devices. They're buying them and they're, and they're using them. And what's interesting to note is Blackberries are being sold in India as well. Blackberries, Blackberries don't have much of a market in China. Uh, they may have a little bit better penetration in India because, of course, the English language. These are a bunch of the devices that are sold there. 
What is driving India's market? The youth. The youth crowd is driving the market. But it isn't just the youth crowd that are buying these mobile devices. Everybody are buying, are buying uh, cell phones in India now. And you can see that multicolored screens, integrated cameras, just like China. They're selling to these various age groups. Under 25, typically. India prepaid, very, very big in, China, in India, as well as China. Prepaid service, the convenience. I mean, I have, a, I have prepaid service. I have a SIM module for Taiwan, for Hong Kong, and for China. It's so easy. Plop in one when you leave the country. You get lower rates when you make phone calls. Cell phones made in India. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? It's reality now. It's reality. There's another company here called Quasar, which I had the pleasure of meeting, and just signing GSM handsets now. Uh, the quality isn't what I would call something I buy, but at least they're getting there. They're getting there. It's just a matter of time before India has the semiconductor business, which all the major semiconductor companies are going into India. TI, Freescale, Intel, they're all going in there to invest in manufacturing. They're already invested in the brain power, in the software side of the business. So as you can see, India, you must have a semiconductor business if you're going to grow your handset business. And it's coming along quite a bit. Manufacture, there's a lot of assembly going on right now, but manufacturing will occur there as well. As you can see here, Samsung has exported made in India handsets to Dubai. LG has made India one of their major, major Asia Pacific regional distribution areas. And you can see that Siemens, slide phone here, Nokia, Samsung. LG, a lot of these devices are now they're being assembled, possibly even designed in India. This is actually the hedge probably how much is actually being designed in Taiwan and China. <clears throat> There's more than politics involved in India and China. There's the future of the entire cell phone and asset industry, actually, right on this. Talk a little bit about CDMA and W Wireless Local Loop Mobile, which is what Reliance has been using as well. Capturing, as you can see here, what Reliance is doing is is bringing wireless telephony to regions of India where they've never seen a cell phone. They've never been able to make phone calls in the past. Now they can do it wirelessly from their little village. It's enabling, it's empowering these little villages. When you empower these little villages with communications, you empower them for their future. You give them a very bright future when they have access to communications and information. <coughs> India has basically had a spectrum role. They want to use 1900 megahertz. And uh, the GSM associations are saying, you can't do that. GSM is 1800. It's supposed to be 1800. Well, what are we using in America? <laughs> Uh, basically, this is, uh, I think this is still ongoing. Is India an IT superpower? Let me pose the question to the crowd. Is India an IT superpower? Can anyone answer this question? This is a question. I need an answer for somebody. Yes. Okay. Why? Uh huh. But do you think that there's an opportunity to sell technology into India as well? Absolutely. So as one goes, one comes. I say that India has been called an IT superpower, but its annual sales of two million computers. Well, maybe we're not going to sell as many computers in India, but we might sell more of these than computers. Same in China, we sell more of these perhaps in computers, or at least notebooks. And um, that's because the mobile, the way these countries are very mobile themselves, uh, plays, has a lot to play with that. Now, with software piracy levels that are very, very high in India as well as China, and with no really made in India tag for these, these famous devices. Do you know when you buy an iPod, you turn it over, what does it say? Well, it actually says made in China, but it's actually designed in, so, so what is the iPod? 
It's designed in Taiwan, it's made in China, and it's sold by Apple in North America. Wow, it's a very multinational product, actually. Um, but when you see made in Taiwan now, it doesn't mean garbage anymore. It used to be that way. Same with Japan 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So one day, do you think it's possible that made in India will perhaps represent the highest quality manufacturer? It's very possible. It's very possible. India needs to make its diversity work for itself. It's not an IT superpower. And sorry, it's, a, it's not an IT superpower, not yet anyway. However, it, it could be the, the world's back office. And it needs to make its diversity work for, it, uh, work for itself as it seeks to become the back office for the world. And it can make China part of its India services. You see that happening now. You see YPRO, you see Infosys, uh, going into China in a big way, putting factories there to tap the software talent in China. So you see the Chinese coming into India, you see the Indians going into China. This is actually very, very important for you CEOs in the crowd. Your one-two strategy for Asia, China and India, it's, it's, a, it's a good bet that if you focus your energies on these two countries, which by the way, does not come with a lot of pain, understanding these countries. But it is very, very important. We need to gain competitive advantage, and we need to be more competitive in this country because these two countries are not letting up on competitiveness. In fact, they're growing by leaps and bounds. So actually, I don't mean to lecture, but we're the ones who need to get out there as world warriors and sell, 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 market, market, market into these countries. China's, the China dream will make way for the India shock. Now, what do I mean by the Pacific century? Well. My entire professional career is focused on the Pacific century. As a very young man, I went to Asia to learn the language, and I started to engage in business in Asia to start my professional career, I morphed that back into North America. So I've essentially been doing it on both sides of the Pacific Rim. I've worked for Western companies, and I've worked for Chinese companies. And Tokyo basically invested a lot of technology transfer into a lot of these little tigers, but now the little tigers, they grew. South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and they became very, very powerful countries. And they started to export, and their whole export engine was growing and growing and growing. Up until China entered the market around 1994 or five. But when China entered the market in the late 90s, a lot of these countries realized, oh, China, the steam engine called China, it's not slowing down. It's, in fact, it's like it's Shanghai levit Levitated Railroad. It's going at 400 kilo kilometers per hour, which is very, very fast. Nobody's going to slow down China. So they thought that they could export their way. But when China came up, China was, has been really taking all of the exports from a lot of these other countries. And while all, all of these other countries now bring their manufacturing into China. So where manufacturing goes, eventually technology goes. China will be the recipient of all of the technology from the West. If you, if you let them. When you're in China, protect your IP. I think everybody's pretty aware of that. Um, countries that thought they could uh, you know, patiently export the way up, roadblock, Great Wall of China is here. The Middle Kingdom is taking center stage. Guess what? India is right behind it. But the paths they used to get there were very different. China is a competitor, as is India. But it's also an opportunity. Opportunity, Weiji, risk, and opportunity always come hand in hand, as the Chinese say. It's a very, very big opportunity for Indian companies as well. No pyramid can be larger than the combination of India and China, if you're a Western manufacturer. Indian companies need to understand China better. How many Indian people can speak Chinese? Not too many. A lot of Chinese speak English. That's helpful. But I believe that there needs to be a better bridge. Um, I've had, I have tried to build a bridge between both countries myself. And they need to understand by setting up offices there, 
not just for liaison, for demonstrating to China's strategy, but for, you need, you need full-fledged business. That's the only way to communicate. Uh, these two countries, they seem similar, but you know, the, fast, the past 50 years, they have been very, very different from each other. Very, very different, the growth and how they developed from each other. And I've had the pleasure, really, and the opportunity to sell and to export to both and to watch their rise. It's been very interesting to watch the rise of both of these countries. The global smartphone revolution, it will amplify and help bridge the communication revolution between China and India. 